In this video, I want to cover a few basic points about act and potency in the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas and how a grasp of these concepts is very useful in refuting heretics. In Thomistic philosophy, act refers to that which already exists. Potency or potentiality refers to that which does not exist, but could. John F. Whipple, The Metaphysical Thought of St. Thomas Aquinas, quote, That which can exist but does not is said to exist in potency. That which already exists is said to exist in actuality, end quote. Now, when referring to the same thing in the same respect, act and potency are mutually exclusive. Something cannot be both actual and potential in the same respect at the same time. Something can be actual in one respect and potential in a different respect, but it cannot be actual and potential in the same respect at the same time. That's because it's impossible for something to both be and not to be in the same respect at the same time. St. Thomas Aquinas, now it is not possible that the same thing should be at once in actuality and potentiality in the same respect, but only in different respects. For what is actually hot cannot simultaneously be potentially hot, but it is simultaneously potentially cold, end quote. Thus, when we say that something is potentially X, that means that it is not actually X. Likewise, when we say that something is actually X, that means that it is not potentially X. With that in mind, let's consider how this is useful in refuting a heresy and a false argument. We will discuss an attempted defense of Antipope John Paul II's heresy on the Incarnation. As we've documented with abundant evidence, John Paul II taught that in the Incarnation itself, the Son of God united himself with every man. That is blatantly heretical, and the logical conclusion of that heresy is that every man is divinized, and in fact the Word made flesh. For example, John Paul II stated on January 25, 1984, quote, Christ, the Son of God, by becoming flesh, assumes the humanity of every man. At this point, he becomes united with every person, end quote. That would mean that every man is the Word of God, as St. Thomas points out. St. Thomas Aquinas, the Word of God did not assume human nature in general, but as an individual, as Damascene says, otherwise every man would be the Word of God, end quote. John Paul II taught this Antichrist heresy many times and in many ways as our material shows. That's why he defines Christianity as the amazement at man, repeatedly substitutes man for Christ, etc., as the series Brother Michael is doing proves. As we just quoted, sometimes John Paul II will teach very explicitly that the Son of God assumed the humanity of all men and became united with all men in the Incarnation. On other occasions, he will add, in a certain way or in a certain sense, as a subterfuge, in the hope of promoting the same heresy against the Incarnation in a less blatant fashion. But as we will see, it's a distinction without a difference because the Incarnation refers to the Son of God actually becoming flesh. That's what it means, and there is no sense, manner, or way in which the Son of God became flesh in all men. Now, in a futile attempt to defend this Antichrist and anti-Catholic heresy of Antipope John Paul II, a certain very faithless and foolish apostate thought that he had discovered a precedent for John Paul II's teaching in the following quote from St. Thomas Aquinas. Summa Part 3, Question 8, Article 3. Hence we must say that if we take the whole time of the world in general, Christ is the head of all men, but diversely. For, first and principally, he is the head of such as are united to him by glory. Secondly, of those who are actually united to him by charity. Thirdly, of those who are actually united to him by faith. Fourthly, of those who are united to him merely in potentiality, which is not yet reduced to act, yet will be reduced to act according to the divine predestination. Fifthly, of those who are united to him in potentiality, which will never be reduced to act. In this passage of St. Thomas's Summa Theologiae, Aquinas teaches that Christ is united to men in different ways, some in actuality and some merely in potentiality. St. Thomas says that Christ is actually united to certain men by glory, to certain men by charity, to certain men by faith. And then he teaches that Christ is united to others merely in potentiality. Based on this reference in St. Thomas to union with people in potentiality, the heretic concluded the following. Aquinas even teaches that all living men are in the mystical body of Christ, even those outside the church, who are in it potentially, though not actually. Thus, even Jews, Muslims, heretics, and heathen are, according to Aquinas, united in a certain way with Jesus Christ and God. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He obviously doesn't know the basics about act and potency in St. Thomas. Remember, act refers to that which already exists. Potency refers to that which does not exist, but could. Act and potency are mutually exclusive when referring to something in the same respect at the same time. Thus, if you say that something is potentially X, it means that it is not actually X, and vice versa. So when Aquinas says that Christ is united to people outside the church in potentiality, what does that mean? It means that Christ is not actually united to them. It means that the union does not exist, but could. So the very passage the heretic cites, which he thinks supports his position, actually refutes his whole argument. 
because it proves that a union between Christ and all men does not actually exist. But because that person is clueless about the basics of act and potency, and he wrongly thinks that potentiality is a kind of actuality, he heretically and disastrously concluded that Jews, Muslims, etc. are actually united to Christ in a certain way. Notice how in the second sentence he uses the language of actuality, presenting it as if it's something that already exists, to misrepresent St. Thomas's teaching, which was in reference to something that is merely potential. Thus, even Jews, Muslims, heretics, and heathen are, according to Aquinas, united in a certain way with Jesus Christ and God. And John Paul II, of course, did not teach that Christ was potentially united to all men in the Incarnation. No, he repeatedly taught that the Son of God actually united himself with each man in the Incarnation, which is, of course, heretical. Now, we are not blaming everyone who does not know the basics about act and potency in Aquinas, but if you are going to try to defend a heresy as that heretic did, it becomes relevant. But only faithless and bad-willed people would be inclined to defend John Paul II's blasphemy. This heretic's error is a great example of how God allows wicked people to fall right into the ditch when attempting to defend heresy and evil. Further, it gets even worse for the heretic because the passage we've been examining from the Summa Theologiae is not even about the Incarnation. It concerns actual and potential union with Christ by grace. The union between Christ's two natures and the person of the Word that resulted from the Incarnation is very different from the union between Christ and a justified man. Hence, even if this passage did deal with the Incarnation, it would still refute the person by teaching that a union with all men is not actual, but it doesn't even deal with the Incarnation. Compounding his stupidity, the heretic then goes on to pervert scripture in an attempt to defend anti-Pope John Paul II's Antichrist blasphemy. We also see the same thing quite ironically taught in the very next verse after the verse, the diamonds cite to establish their doctrine of Antichrist that they attribute to John Paul II. 1 John 4 verses 3 to 4, And every spirit that dissolves Jesus is not of God, and this is Antichrist, of whom you heard that he cometh, and he is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome him, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. What is this? St. John dissolved Jesus Christ into all the people reading his epistle right as he was teaching them that to dissolve Jesus Christ was a doctrine of Antichrist? The heretic now cites 1 John 4, 4, which he thinks provides some kind of precedent for John Paul II's heresy. But he is once again totally wrong, and this time he is directly perverting scripture. 1 John 4, 4 refers to the indwelling of God in the souls of the just by grace. That has nothing at all to do with John Paul II's heresy that the Son of God united himself with every man in the Incarnation itself. First, the indwelling in the souls of the just applies to certain men, not to all. Thus, there is no comparison to what John Paul II preached, namely a union between Christ and all men in the Incarnation itself. Second, the union between God and a justified man by grace is very different from the union of Christ's two natures in the person of the Word. When the three divine persons of the Trinity dwell within the soul of a justified man, and that indwelling is not sanctifying grace itself, but accompanies sanctifying grace, the just man's substantial act of existence remains distinct from God's act of existence, even though God indwells that person. But in the Incarnation, the humanity is assumed by the person of the Word and exists in the person of the Word. St. Thomas, quote, Hence the human nature of Christ has a greater dignity than ours from this very fact that in us, being existent by itself, it has its own personality but in Christ it exists in the person of the Word, end quote. St. Robert Bellarmine, Therefore, in the Incarnation, the Word communicated his own subsistence to a human nature, and thus the hypostatic union was made, end quote. Subsistence refers to a thing's existence in itself as an individual. In Catholic theology, it is used to mean person. The Word does not communicate his own subsistence to the humanity of justified souls. A just man's subsistence or person remains distinct from Christ's subsistence or person. Hence, 1 John 4, 4, which refers to God dwelling in the souls of just men, has nothing at all to do with Antipope John Paul II's blasphemous heresy and provides no precedent for it. Indeed, when we understand what the Incarnation was, it only further serves to expose the malice of John Paul II's heresy. In the Incarnation, the subsistence of the Word was communicated to the assumed humanity. Thus, the assumed humanity could never be separated from God. It means that the assumed humanity was deified, not by being converted into the divine nature, which would be the heresy of Eutychianism, but by its conjunction with the divine nature in one person, St. Thomas. The flesh of Christ is said to be deified, as he, Damascene, also says, not by change, but by union with the word, its natural property still remaining, and hence it may be considered as deified inasmuch as it becomes the flesh of the word of God, end quote. 
As we can see, what was united to the Son of God in the Incarnation itself was deified. So if the Son of God in the Incarnation itself united himself in any way to every man with the flesh of all men, as John Paul II repeatedly taught, then every man was deified. And that, of course, is also what John Paul II preached over and over again. That's why he preached universal salvation, that Christ was united to each man forever, etc. Further, to avoid heresy against the Incarnation, one must profess that the union was personal. That is, that it was made in the person or hypostasis, hence it's called the hypostatic union. Thus, even if for the sake of argument, John Paul II taught that in becoming flesh in the Incarnation itself, the Son of God united himself in a non-personal way with all men and with all flesh, it would still be heresy. It would still run afoul of Christian dogma and attempt to dissolve Christ in an Antichrist fashion. The truth is that his teaching is that the Son of God became each man in the Incarnation, and he thereby substitutes man for Christ. Hence, there is no defense for John Paul II's Antichrist heresy and his substitution of man for God. And the people who try to defend it, such as the foolish and clueless heretic we just refuted, simply reveal their dishonesty and bad will in their quest to defend heresy. Indeed, John Paul II's preaching in this regard fulfills prophecy about the end times beast and the Antichrist, as our material covers.